Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and we are continuing our municipal series where we sit down with Reeves, mayors, counselors from across this great country to talk to them about themselves, their community, but also their duty to serve. Today, we are heading to Alberta, where we are sitting down with Reeve, Don Crouch, who is the Reeve of Flagstaff County, and I'm 90% sure I just got his last name wrong because he smiled at me while I did it. No, that was right on the money. Ah, uh, Don, thank you. Don, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So before we get started into the substance of the interview, I'm going to start with the very same question I've asked all municipal councillors. Where'd your sense of duty to serve come from, Don? Um, I think we have to go back to where I'm from. I'm from a very small community in East Central Alberta. Uh, <laughs> the village I'm from is Strom. It's about 300 people-ish. And when I lived in Strom, the person right beside me was the, the town man for the village. Um, he was everything to everybody. He was part of the curling club. He was uh, egg society. He, he did a lot of good things for the, the community and continued to. And beside him was the mayor at the time, Wade. So uh, I was kind of surrounded by community minded people. And in a small community, lots of times we spent a lot of time on Morris's deck. And um, when we all met there, uh, we, uh, I did a lot of listening. I, I listened to these community minded members talk about how are they are in the community and how they feel, how they feel important to give to the community, be part of the community, be a leader in the community. And uh, so mine was a learned behavior uh, of, of doing that. I wanted to emulate those community leaders in that. And so after a couple nights on, on the deck, I found myself uh, on the fire department. Uh, lo and behold, it cursed me and being on the fire department. And I enjoyed that. It's just one way to serve the community. And later on, I was uh, calling bingo for the local egg society to raise funds for the community because Morris was a part of that. And uh, so he, he got me into that. And then uh, in about 92, Wade, at mayor at the time, uh, convinced me to run for town council. I said, sure, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So in October, I put my name forward and, and I got elected. Um, as counselor, uh, I was pretty young and naive at the time, probably a little bit cocky also. I thought, ah. what does a small village of uh, 300 do? Well, they cut the grass and they plow the snow. Well, I went to the first meeting and uh, I couldn't have been more wrong. It was a very humbling experience. Uh, well, it's all involved in municipal politics and, and the structure. And, and, and I really enjoyed my first three years as counselor. I enjoyed it so much. I put my name stand for the next election and then the next election so I had three terms on a village council one is councillor under Wade's mentorship and the last two as mayor so so that was three terms and then in 2016 Strong became a hamlet we dissolved and so in the next election cycle I put put my name forward for county council uh, I think it was another opportunity to serve the community in that way and in that October I got elected uh, and at our organizational meeting, I was elected Reeve, and I've been a Reeve for a term and a half, I guess, or term and a quarter, and same kind of thing. I thought I knew it all for spending nine years on municipal village council. Yeah, no, I didn't. It was another humbling experience. Uh, it was like drinking water from a fire hose, but uh, luckily for me at Flagstaff County, we have a really good team around us and support us, a lot of us new councillors, and made that transition quite a bit easier uh so mine was a learned behavior to, to give back to the community in the way you can become a leader the more you put into a community the more you get out so that's kind of the way i got interested in in politics okay there's a lot to unravel there for a second <laughs> a i gotta ask the million dollar question do you still call bingo if not let's let's arrange that so you can call bingo at a local flagstaff county event here <laughs> yeah uh we let the bingo go <laughs> uh, quite a few years ago because of the VLTs came in and, and but that bingo hall is there's a quite a quite an experience when you fill a hall of 300 with 350 people <laughs> and uh, it's, it's quite the clientele but it was a lot of fun and uh, we raised a lot of funds for the community uh, to port, support recreation or whatever the needs of the community were at that time. So you kind of uh, opened a lot of doors here and I want to play in a few of the rooms here for a second but I want to go back to 1992. The very first mm -hmm. election that you ran in, 
Now, everyone remembers the first time they see their name on the ballot because it's a humbling experience because you know at least you're going to get one vote. No matter what, you're voting for yourself unless you don't. And then that's a very another conversation we need to have. What was that experience like for you to see your name on the ballot? Because you talk about how you were cocky a little bit. Were you cocky when you saw it or was it a humbling experience? Um, I think it was humbling. Uh, there was an election lots of times in small municipalities, you just acclaimed, there, not that much interest. But at that election, there was, uh, I'm not sure how many, but that we did have an election. And uh, to say I wasn't nervous, I'd be lying, because I was very nervous. I didn't know how people thought of me in the community. Did they think I was a, a, a cocky young man or with the ability or, to do it or not? And um, I worked away a lot prior to that. So I didn't know how the community would feel about that but uh yeah they put some trust in me and hopefully i hopefully i repaid that and walking into the council chambers the town council chambers for the mm-hmm. very first time it's a it's another humbling experience because now you have the weight and responsibility of your neighbors and your family on your shoulders because the decisions you make are affecting their pocketbooks their house their community How much of a weight and responsibility did you put on yourself to make sure you did the right thing at each of those council meetings? And do you still carry that weight and responsibility to today as Reeve? Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good question. Um, Municipal government is the closest government to the people they serve. Um, The decisions you make every day at the council chamber is in the best interest of the whole region. And um, they directly affect your neighbor the neighbor down the street and neighbor across town or in that whole community. So that, that does weigh uh, very hard, especially in a small community. There's no way of hiding from the decisions you make. Uh, the decisions you make, they are for the entirety of the whole region. And if they're good decisions based on good information, making those decisions are hard because, you know, they may impact each individual differently, uh, especially when there's a change of service delivery or an increased cost of service delivery, which comes up often. And um, it's, it's tough, but if you're, you're confident in your decision making, they're defendable decisions, uh, you can go to your neighbor and say, hey, we went this path because of this region or that reason. And um, you can't think short term in these decision making, it's long term, the benefit of the region or your municipality or your community for the long term. And um, but how I think you- it's harder in a Oh, yeah. how, how do you weigh the growth of your municipality or even your county against the needs of your constituents? Because if I go talk to people in Flagstaff County tomorrow and I ask them mm-hmm. the question, what's the important to you? They're going to say the pothole. They're going to say the water. Yeah. They're going to say the sidewalk. They're going to say the the park in our area needs upgrading. How do you balance that with the needs to move the uh, the community forward as one instead of individual communities that make up one. Yeah, absolutely. So that's where a long-term vision, a long-term planning uh, comes in. Uh, Cause for sure they, they notice the potholes cause they use the road every day. They notice the sidewalks got a crack in it cause they walk on it every day. But the long-term ver- vision is understanding the challenges you're facing today and the impact they have in the future. And for our region, what we really, uh, recognize is depopulation and urbanization the deep the population decline in rural i think it's faced in all of rural and so you're providing the same service you did 10 years ago but you only have half the many people paying for them same services and so we at flagstaff county we we have that hope to have that long-term vision we identified depopulation or urbanization as a as a threat to our municipality and so we brought up different strategies. How, how do we combat that? How do we reverse that trend? And uh, some strategies we have uh, is that we have a really strong online presence. Uh, we know that our community members now need the tools to access what service we provide and how we provide it and what's our long-term version vision and what's our strategic plan. And more importantly, the people looking into our region, they have access to what we are doing now. What are our priorities? What are our uh, what's our vision long term, not for just my term or the next term, but the term 20 years down the road. And having that online present helps a lot in that. Um, we have a really strong economic development team here. Um, we, you want to come to stay in your region or come to your region to make a living. You got to have a way to make a living. You got to put 
shackles in your, your, your purse. And so we really focus on the people that are here that have put up a business. So we give them the sports to not only survive, but to grow and thrive. So they can hire another person. So that, that they'll bring that people into. And having those tools available online makes other people see that we uh, value economic development. We value, we value your lifestyle. We, va- we want you in our community. We want to support you in that and that. And uh, okay. yeah, there's a couple of strategies. So you've opened up another room here and I want to ask, because if you go talk to your community members in any part of Flagstaff County, Mm -hmm. you're going to say they moved to Flagstaff County because the small town feel, they like the small town feel, they like the, you get to know people and you know, everyone in town. When you're the council, you you want to expand, you want to grow, you want to move the uh, community forward. How do you balance yeah. growth with that against the small town feel that so many community members may want to continue to see, not today, but 10, 15 years down the line? Yeah, I think the key part of that is communication and long term planning, like I was saying before. Explain to them that as our costs go up and our needs go up and our service levels go up, we cannot just pass our downloading that cost to the people that are here we need other people to come into our region uh, other businesses other community members to spread that uh, cost over Uh, we don't want to keep putting the burden on the same 10 people how about we spread that burden over 20 people instead of two businesses let's do 12 businesses and in that we'll grow together we'll uh We'll have more capacity to do other things in the community. Are people and, uh, open to that? Are people open to hearing that message? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, we're rural. Uh, we're not a very big municipality. We're big in land mass, but our rural population is only about uh, 4,000 people. So there is lots of room to, to grow, lots of room to um, expand in that area. Um, our main two industries is agriculture which is the backbone because it's not going anywhere. And it's, it, it's been a, a livelihood for centuries here. And then the oil and gas sector, which is up and down. And we, we followed that roller coaster out here, up and down. So just a more diversified economy is what we're after. Uh, population growth, uh, keep our schools open. Uh, when, you, when you lose population, you lose a lot of social capacity. Um, you're losing your fire departments, uh, your schools may close, some of your health uh, care centers may struggle to stay open. So the, we need the population base to, to continue providing the services we have and hopefully expand them. You you talked about how local government is the front line of government. It is the one that mm-hmm. if you go to the grocery store, people are going to know who you are, Reed. Yeah. If you go yeah. pick up your post, they're going to know who you are. How do you That's balance right. that? Because while a Reeves job is technically part-time. It is a full-time job because you are always on. How do you balance that need of Don's time versus Reeves time? <laughs> yep. Oh, that's, it's amazing. You brought that up. I was recycling today at the recycling cardboard box and a rate payer rolls up there and he starts giving me a hard time, like very jokingly, in, but it's still a, still meant as a heads up or it's yep. there's meaning behind that for sure um but as long as you have make decisions that are defendable and have uh, good information behind them and good background you just uh convey that in the the nicest way possible and we are very uh, fortunate that our in rural alberta and this region in general they're very respectful they may not agree what the council's path or they may have reservations the way we're going, but they'll listen, uh, they'll accept that path, and then we'll move on. I think we're very lucky that way. Of course, there's the odd time where it, um, there is no middle ground or there's no no consensus, but that happens. And that's as long as I feel or council feels we're making the right decisions for the region, I think quite comfortable with, with moving ahead. So let's talk about that aspect of it as well, because in Flagstaff County, you're broken up to into, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong here, seven districts or eight districts? Uh, seven eight. electoral seven districts. Ele- yeah, seven electoral districts. And you are the Reeve, but you also represent Ward 5 or District 5, I should say. Yes. Um, how do you balance the needs of District 1 versus District 5? Yeah. Or do you, ha- as, as Reeve, have to look at it and say, you know what, as elected officials, we can't look at it as 
one area versus the other. We have to look at it as all because even though we're getting asked by our residents, our ratepayers, to advocate for District 5, we can't look at it that way because we have to move the county forward as a whole and not just individual subsections. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a challenge, I think, with, with any type there's uh, uh, districts. Uh, the important stuff in District 5 may not be the most important stuff in District 1. I think what we've got to really preach, and as, as Reeve, is we've got to think regionally. Uh, we're stronger together as a unit. The decision's got to be made regionally to move this forward. It's easily said, but sometimes difficult to do. And just What's the most difficult part of it? What's the most difficult part of the moving as one together forward? Um, I think all elected officials are passionate why they're there. They're passionate to serve the people they want. Yep. And if their region, for whatever region, has a, an issue that they're really passionate about, and, and the councillor's passionate about the region he's representing, is to find consensus among the seven of us, what is the best path forward? Uh, you may not get 100% of the buy-in at that region, and you may not get the, the other regions 100% buy-in, but there's got to be consensus somewhere, some middle ground that we can move forward. And that's um, that's ongoing on, I wouldn't say every issue, but a lot of issues. And uh, we is struggled it, with that. Is it yeah. important not to take the, the, the final vote serious? Well, it's important to take it serious, but you may have a split decision in the council meeting where it's five, four or three, four or whatever. Yep. And sometimes your side might lose or sometimes your side might win. Is it important to always remember at the end of the day, we walk out, we're still friends and we're still colleagues and we can't take the decisions that are made in council back home with us because it's not going to help the growth of our community. Yeah. And that's key at any level or any organization, even if it's a, a social group, a egg society, yeah. that when you're around the table before the vote comes, you state your, your position with how you feel, why you feel that way and your ramifications. We go around the table that way. Everybody has an opportunity to speak. Uh, when the vote comes, the vote comes. Uh, whoever wins or loses doesn't matter. Uh, that's the path council as a whole has decided to move forward. It doesn't matter if the vote's unanimous or split. That's what we are. And we know we have a really strong council that way that's been uh, preached to us that council's voice is one voice. Uh, you don't leave this table with your own opinion. You can say, I voted against this issue because this is what I think. But council as a whole said this is the best path forward and I support council and I will work towards that, that goal. And um, just this council is really amazing. Um, one of my best friends or friends on council, we're polar opposites on a lot of issues uh, just because of our backgrounds eh? it's it, just the way it is but he still picks me up every time and we always go to meetings together and <laughs> we go we don't do much socially like as families but at work we're, we're buds all the way through and uh, I think you need that to have a functioning uh, council or a group or you just got to have you got to park your pride and go with the uh, consensus and everybody rolling in the same direction so it's tough no question about it have you ever been persuaded by uh, an opinion by a fellow counselor because you're supposed to go in there with an open mind yes you get you get your meetings and your agenda packets beforehand that are presented by uh, staff but you have to go in there with an open mind and sometimes you may have an opinion on one issue have you ever been persuaded and how important is it for local elected officials to keep an open mind when hearing other opinions and other outs outside perspectives on a certain issue? Yeah, good question. Uh, I'm going to go back to a, a situation we had uh, about three years ago about surface types in our region. We were changing surface road, surface types for costs and that kind of issue. And I was dead. I was focused on this is the way we got to do it. We have to do it this way. It only makes this sense this way. And then I was called, I was invited to a, a community meeting out at a, a farmer's uh, in my district. And I sat around the room and and I, I listened, I listened, I listened, I listened. And when I left there, I stopped and I said, um, if, I, if I'm not working for these guys, who am I working for? Like these guys are salty, they're people, they're community minded people. And I did. Now I saw that side, and I changed my position on that. And uh, and that happens in the community at uh, community meetings, obviously, if you're willing to listen. And then obviously at the council table, because uh, it's you're supposed to go with an open mind, 
absolutely. I try to do that as best as possible, but I'm only human. Uh, when I read the agenda, I come to a uh, an issue that's before council, and yeah, well, I can see it going this way. But you come here, and then a councillor from Division Two comes up with a a different viewpoint on it, and that's the importance of having a diverse council uh, from various backgrounds, various ages, and various industries, and we have that here, so we're lucky that way. So, so it happens more often than you think. I can imagine. Uh, it's one thing that I always find interesting because in provincial or even federal politics, you have to have your mind made up before you go in because your party tells you. As independents, yeah. you kind of have that open playground where you are able to adapt to what people say. And it's kind of nice, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, you got to remember why we came. We came to serve our residents, our, our community, our, our business community. And so we always put that, what I feel and what they feel, they could be separate, but I always have to fall back to who am I serving? Why am I here? Yeah. Uh, and uh, lots of times it changes for sure. It changes. If it doesn't change, if you had a, if you're stagnant all the way through, you make your decisions a week before the meeting, that's, that's not good governance by any way, shape or form. Abuse against municipal officials, elected and staff members, has risen dramatically over the past handful of years, and to date, everyone has been dealing with these issues on their own, and often on a case-by-case -case basis. While we can't eliminate all abuse of officials, we can take steps to mitigate the impact of those instances. On April 27th and April 28th, Strategic Steps Incorporated is hosting a symposium in Edmonton, Alberta, focused on bucking the trend. Attendees will come away with the understanding of fostering a safe space for both administration and council. Learn from industry leaders on how to deal with unsafe and abusive behavior, how to build a supportive team that provides support, and you can walk away with the tools and resources to help avoid abuse in local government. Get your tickets today at buckingthetrend.ca. I want to turn to segment two now, and that is the Flagstaff County as a whole. Now, you've talked about some issues that are facing the community, uh, the county already. You talked mm -hmm. about depopulation and economic development. And before I ask this question, I'm going to preface this by saying this is a, a conversation between myself and the read. This is not an opinion of council. This is not a motion at council. This is his opinion. We get a lot okay. of random emails from people that say this is not what council's talking about. Well, that's his opinion. So, Reeve, okay. I'm going to ask the million dollar question that a lot of people are probably asking themselves right now. What is the biggest issue, in your opinion, that is facing Flagstaff County as of recording this today? Um. As of today, uh, it's probably the same challenge that all rural and urbans are, are, are facing is a shortage of healthcare professionals in our region because uh, we're blessed with three health facilities and a long-term care. And um, the impact of not having those uh, facilities operating at full capacity, it affects our residents directly, our elderly, it affects business. We have the Hardesty Hub here, which is a big oil moving company out here. And uh, not to have a uh, an operating full-time emergency ward in that region for those many, many workers, it, it really inhibits growth. And uh, so we identified that that problem and we uh, we created a group with AHS and Covenant and RPAP and community leaders and uh, business community elected officials to make a made in Flagstaff uh, solution moving forward and uh, so in the new year we'll be implementing some of those strategies and so, uh, if you don't have health care you don't have security that way you know it's important to, for sure okay so you are not the first uh, mayor Reaver yeah. to talk about health care not even in yeah. urban centers or rural centers everyone says that i'm going to challenge you a little bit here health care is okay. not a municipal issue Healthcare is yeah, not right. a municipal issue. It's a provincial issue. But your residents have elected you to advocate for them. So Correct. how does that advocacy work for your county? And how much, I'm going to say this as nicely as possible, pardon my French here, but how much shit do you have to raise with the provincial government to say, okay, guys, let's get on top of this because 
you may not think rural's a important place to park tax dollars or healthcare dollars, but yep. my constituents need them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a good example is healthcare and it's relationship building. I think you got to have a strong relationship with your MLA and your MP. Well, MLA for healthcare for sure. And, and work through them as best as you can. We had an instance with the oil and gas re review a few years back where the province's direction was not in favor of rural Alberta and was in direct uh, adversarial. Uh, their actions, what they were thinking about that would have had a detrimental effect on uh, on our municipality among others. Uh, and so we worked through our MLA um, and we did an advocacy campaign because we knew it was so, so detrimental the path they were focused on. And um, we worked hard. We did a online campaign, a whole bunch of different avenues just to get the word out, first of all, to our residents that this is a big issue. And as for you, we need your help to help advocate for us as a region to phone your MLA to email the energy minister and all that and uh, through that we got a lot of uh, attention uh, what the opposition actually tweeted one of our billboards out and it, it went viral and so we had a lot of a lot of inquiries into us our region about uh, why are you doing this and our M Oh, I probably shouldn't tell you this. Our, our relationship with our MLA was a little strained at the time because that. Uh... Hey, hey, you know what? This is the great thing about this these conversations. They're just honest to goodness conversations. And hopefully we move the dial. I know we're coming through a provincial election here right now. We're about to go into one in May. Maybe some of these conversations that I'm having with Alberta uh, municipal councillors and Reeves and mayors will move some of these issues to the forefront because dear God, we need to have these conversations. And yep. if, if yep. municipalities aren't getting along with their provincial counterparts, their MLAs, their cabinet ministers, it's not the relationships that suffers. It's the people in these communities that suffer. <laughs> yeah. And you got to respect their viewpoint because they're looking at the provincial view. Yeah. But we, in that instance, we really looked at our regional view and pushed that view towards our MLA to the energy minister, to the premier's office. And they backed away. And that was not just because of our efforts, it's the efforts of the entire rural, rural caucus. They're on our side also too. So it works. And since then, we've got a really strong relationship with our MLA and, and she's working with us on a couple of initiatives as of today. So, Oh, that's awesome. So, but it's a respect. She respects our role and we respect her role and we can have those tough conversations. We can be on, on polar opposites, but after that issue is done, we can work together. Just like in council chambers, you can. Do you see that relationship corresponding to the relationship the county has with its residents? Because we go back to the question I talked about, about the different districts, right? About district mm -hmm. one, two, three, five, six. Sometimes the people in district two are going to be very upset. And at the yeah. end of the day, as long as we have that cordial relationship, we can fight like hell. But at the end of the day, we can still go grab a beer afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. That's crucial. Um, I like to think as municipal leaders, we're bridge builders. We're not bridge takers down. Uh, we, we have the ability to have a frank and open and sometime heated discussion at council chambers or with our representatives of other local governments or our neighbors. And after the end of the day, we do go for a beer. There's no question about it. Um, well, I respect uh, our, if one of our municipalities in our region, one of the, the villages and towns, they're adamant about a, a certain issue and we're on the other side of it which can happen because urban's rural, you know, there's, there's a lot of similarities, but sometimes uh, differences come out, but we can have sit around the table and have that discussion and it can get heated. It can get yeah. uh, tense, but at the end of the day, we still go golfing together. There, there's no question about that. So, and then the next day I can pick up the phone and call that same municipal leader and say, Hey, I need a little help on this issue. What do you think about that? And it, it, it's okay. And I think that you got to have that culture to have good government. You can't hold grudges. You can't, can't, you got to park your pride. You got to just be humble, a humble servant. So. The cost of living has been a big issue that's on a lot of people's minds right now. Yep. And as municipalities, the last few years have been uh, tough. Let's just yes. call it what it is tough. Um, 
this budget cycle, when I'm talking to municipal leaders from across Canada, but also in Alberta, has been probably the toughest out of the last few years because things are getting back to normal, but the cost of inflation, the cost of living mm-hmm. has gone significantly up. As Reeve, as council, how are you ensuring that service level doesn't go down, but at the same time, the growth that you need to happen happens without destroying someone's pocketbook? Yeah, absolutely. Yep, that's the uh, golden ticket question for sure. I know uh, we're very cognizant of, as a municipality, we're the lowest uh, government on the totem pole. Uh, we got the feds and we got the province. The province downloads. Uh, the feds increase taxes or carbon tax. So we really only have one revenue stream. That revenue stream is uh, is our our electric, our business owners, uh, big business, small business. So we're really cognizant of not passing that down to to them every time something comes up. Um, so we budget meetings are tough. Uh, we do uh, we prioritize what we feel as needs and wants and uh, we shuffle the deck and change service levels we have to if we want to continue not passing that burden down to that electric and we've been really successful for in the last uh, five years there has been no increases on uh, residential and no increase across the board except for this year we we upped it a little bit on farmland so we've been very successful with that and changing service levels as long as it's communicated why and what's the end result i'm not changing service levels just to increase taxes you know you can't have both yeah. so if you if you communicate that this is our focus this is how we have to get that so we don't burden our, our rate payers and and uh, have people move away because the taxes are too high or a business doesn't come in because we're not as competitive as our neighbor next door. You know, that that's something we're really cognizant of and uh, we continue to work for it. Uh, do we get it right all the time? Uh, no, absolutely not. Um, it's uh, it's a public engagement, uh, doing what you think is best. And if, if we go down a path that may, yeah, we're humble enough to look back at some of the decisions and change them. Uh, we're just a bunch of volunteer public officials, a great team around us to give us a lot of good information, but yeah. You, you talk help? about, you, <laughs> it, uh, you talk about communication a lot. You talked about communications, yep. how you do a lot of stuff online because that's as a, as a community that is very diverse and very spread out, unlike sort of more, more urban centers uh, you need to be online as someone who came from the communications sector as well, yeah. I can tell you that you can communicate to the, you are blue in the face as an elected official. You can communicate, you can send out emails, you can send out uh, links, you can put things in your utility bills, but there's going to be that one person who always says, well, I didn't get it. I didn't, yeah. I didn't understand this. You didn't inform me unless you go knock on their door and stand there and tell them 12 times, they're not going to get it. When, at what time do you, as an elected official or a counselor, have to say, okay, enough's enough. We, we can keep on trying to be cordial and try to communicate, but if people aren't getting it, we kind of just still have to move forward and not be stuck on an issue for so long. Yeah, yeah, very true. Um, when, when we first came on the council, we had some pretty... Um, strong issues that was passed on to a, our new council and as a council we decided we got to make make these decisions because it's been carried on for quite a few years yeah and we made those tough decisions and um and we tried to communicate as much as we possible but since we're such a small community and where there's only there's seven of us for four thousand we're in the community anyways yeah and uh if you have that respect that they can come up to you at the the hockey arena and say hey what are you guys thinking about this issue? And you have the ability in that respectful dialogue and they feel comfortable coming up to talk to you. That's the best way to communicate because it's two way uh, email links is one way. You don't get anything back. And to, and we try to do a lot of open houses. I try to go to every, well, I should say every, as many community events as I can as a reef because as a, because then that that opens the door that they can come talk to you about whatever's on their mind. So are people willing to give you their their opinion? Yep. Oh, for sure. Oh, that's awesome. And 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 it's respectful. Oh, 
a lot of times there was really? uh, uh, yep uh, i don't know what it is uh, about this region i got a uh, a call from a, a repair uh, it's an old lot uh the last couple of while and he couldn't get his car down the road because the snow was left on there and he says i don't want to call you don i i hate calling you i don't want to be that guy but man i can't get my car to town you know is there anything you could do and so well absolutely i contacted public works and in a short time they, they plowed the road but that's their apologetic to bring up an issue a lot of them uh it's just that respect wow. they have or we have to each other on both sides you get to the point where there is very little respect that way but then you just got to compartmentalize that or just put it to the side hey we're doing the best we can this is all we can do and that noise that from an unreasonable rate payer you just got to park it don't take it personally uh, leave it at the office if they they call you at home you listen thank you very much and park it if you know that you are acting in the best interest of the organization the best interest of the entire region and all the electricity you still go to sleep at night with, with parking some of that that I negative think, stuff we get there's a lot of city councilors town councilors county councilors and municipal district councilors who are envious of you right now because oh, i talk yeah. to a lot and they're not respectful according to them so here we are yeah. but you got to focus on the 80 percent of the good noise or the 90 percent of the good noise you can't focus so, on the 10 so stay off Life's social media is what you're saying just get yeah. off social media and just not do oh, anything yeah. um yeah, we, we, yeah. go ahead uh, we have that too we have a social media site that rant and rave i think every community has it's or whatever it may be i just stay off it um if it's important enough to contact me uh i'm not gonna i'm not gonna go down in the weeds with some of those uh, topics i won't engage unless it's a formal respectful dialogue so maybe i shelter myself that way hey I, I think we all should because social media has been the downfall of society there's my yeah. rant for the day <laughs> I want to I want to turn to my last segment because I'm cautious of time here, Reeve, and that is tourism, 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 yes. tourism. As a as a person who likes to travel and stay within Canada when uh, spending my tourism dollars, I'm going to be visiting Flagstaff County in the coming months. So, as a tourist who's listening to this or to myself, what should I be looking for? What should I be doing as a tourist in Flagstaff County? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we're East Central Alberta, pretty flat, but we do have a uh, unique feature i guess not a unique feature we have the battle river that's uh, on our south and eastern borders that's our border with the other municipalities and along that there's activities down there you can paddle the battle there's a, a paddle guide through battle river watershed that tells you where to put in and when when to take out and campgrounds to stay at it uh, along that there's a big knife uh, provincial park right on the, the river valley that has trails it's fully serviced and we have 15 campgrounds in our region so there's no going online you just roll in there and, and set up and a lot of them are along the battle river so as an outdoor enthusiast uh, that's something i i would really recommend and we do have a ski hill in them hills too so in the winter it's a great place to um, learn how to ski to do dancy green out there and to continue skiing you never think that in in rural alberta especially flat east central but and uh it's a strong economic driver people come from all over to that hill wow. um one thing, it is unique. We have a Battle River short line. Battle River Rail owns a short line, which is producer owned. Uh, we bought shares in it years ago. It used to be an old uh, CN line that they were going to decommission. But the producers in this area said, hey, we need this to get our product to market. And it's a, a good economic driver, but there's also a tourism part to that. There's the Friends of the Battle River Rail that operate excursions throughout the year. Uh, they do about 10 a year, uh, winter, spring, summer, winter, fall, doesn't matter. They have a heated car, an outdoor car, and um, a caboose, oh, of course, an engine. And uh, one of the excursions I went on, which I thought was really, really cool, was we went, we got on an alliance, which is one of the communities in our, our region, and we toured the little train station there, a lot of history there. And then we got on and we went to our next community, Galahad, which is only 12 miles away. and. Uh, the local 4-H club got on their horses and they robbed us. So they stopped the train, they got on, and uh, for ransom, we had to give them something for a donation for their cause, whatever it was, 10 bucks for some cause they were doing. So that was awesome. And dealing with the kids was fun. And then the last stop is in Heisler, and that's the best uh, restaurant I'd recommend going there in a heartbeat. It's called Big Willie's Bar. Um, there you're... We were uh, served uh, 
a true farm to plate uh, meal. Uh, the world famous Heisler sausage, which is made across the street in the general store with product from the area, was served to us. And we had pierogies from another uh, community member just two miles out of town and all the fixings that were locally locally sourced. And so that's really a unique uh, experience for a, a whole day. And then riding in that open air car they have in the middle of summer it was really really an experience because you're looking out there and you're seeing the canola you can smell the canola in bloom you see see the deer running across because it's a lot different than in a car smoking by uh at 60 miles an hour so i'd recommend that for sure well i'm looking forward to visiting big willie's bar because i'm always yeah. a big fan so we might have i might have to meet up with you at big willie's bar and continue this conversation but I want, to, I want to ask the question about yourself in the county. After a stressful county council, after a stressful day doing your regular job, where do you, where do you go to relax and decompress? Now, and I'm going to preface this, you can't say your house. A lot of councillors and mayors and Reeves say, we, I go to my house to decompress. No, where in the county do you go? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, absolutely. I've got a, a, a fantastic little hideaway uh, for about last... I don't know, 25, 30 years, uh, Sunday nights is reserved for room five at the Daysland Arena. It's an old timers hockey club I've been a part of with for a very long time, the Daysland Night Hawks. And uh, so, so every Sunday night we'd go there and we play hockey and we play during the week. And it's just an excellent place to decompress because uh, that uh, dressing room feel is kind of like the inner sanctum. We could say anything in there, you know, it's not going anywhere. And that room, when the first time I got invited to, uh, to play with those guys, the room was full of uh, community leaders. We had elected officials, we had doctors, we had egg service board presidents, minor hockey presidents. And that's another area where I just sat back and listened. Um, the benefits of being part of your community and being a leader in a community. And that was just a, a good part. And so I've been doing that for oh, a very long time. And uh, I wasn't getting any older, but everybody in the room was getting quite a bit younger. So it came a time I had to put up my hockey stick in the rack and leave it there. But I picked up a whistle. So I ref those guys every Sunday night still oh, uh, just wow. to be a part of that community and, and uh, just be a part of that great bunch of guys. And now I played with the guys, the dads, and now the kids are playing. And now they're the hockey, minor hockey league presidents. They're the egg society. So it's a learned behavior out here. So that's, uh, and we hang out all summer. It's just a good group of, oh, there's a bunch of us. And it's generational. Like uh, I played with the dads and now I'm reffing the, the boys, but they're 30, 40 years old, mind you, but they're not boys, men. So the, the last question, and this is, this is, this is, a, I, I get to learn a little, little bit more about your community with this question. And it, that is what makes Flagstaff County such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? Good question. Um, sense of community i think it's probably no different than many many other rural groups uh we're a little different uh we don't have a big hub we don't have a town of five thousand. we don't have a town of ten thousand. where you maybe lose that sense of community we're uh, 10 communities within a region and each community has their their uniqueness their pride and uh to continue with what they do i think that's really, really unique and being only a community of we have four thousand. Uh, urbans and 4,000 rural. Uh, we need to work together. We need to have that sense of community because without that partnership or that respect back and forth and among the whole region, we're not going to survive against the bigger communities. We can't compete against a, a city of Edmonton in any aspect. So I think it's just the pride of our region. Uh, it's generational, uh, strong history. We've been generational farms here for years. So we have uh, your dad farmed, your grandpa farmed, you farmed, and your kids will farm. And that just gives a little continuity to the whole community. That's amazing. Um, Reeve Crouch, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor to sit down with you and talk about yourself, but also Flagstaff County. It's, uh, it's always interesting to hear from different perspectives and different community leaders. And you, you're, County is well served with you at the head of the council table. Oh, yeah. So thank you so much for, for doing this. Yeah. And thanks for this opportunity. And uh, we'll make a date for Big Willies. Yes. It'll be uh, an experience for you for sure. We'll have yes. fun. Uh, 
We certainly will. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media, go have a conversation with somebody. You'd be surprised at how it changes ourselves, our community, but also democracy. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking.